Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Mark Prince and Paul Harding to discuss The Latinus, published by our friends at W.W. Norton and Company. Mark Prince is a recent graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and a recipient of fellowship from the Truman Capote Literary Trust, the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, and the Sun Valley Writers Conference. To moderate tonight's conversation, we are also joined by Paul Harding, who is the author of two novels, Tinkers, which won the 2010 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, and Enon. He has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and PEN America. He has taught the Iowa's Writers Workshop, the Missioner Center for Writers, and Harvard University. He is currently a professor in the Creative Writing and Literature MFA program at Stony Brook University. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And please order your copy of the Latinist from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. It is so important to us that you support our local indies during these times, and we appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi. Hey, Mark. Good to hey, see Paul. you. Good thank you for that. You thank you for that great introduction, by the way. <laughs> um, it's great to see you. I feel like such a, uh, it's such a stroke of good fortune to be able to just be a part of this event and celebrate this, this great novel coming out. Um, eventually, we can talk about how I was sort of kind of with you when you were beginning it, starting yeah. it out. Um, yeah. Um, we can go down that rabbit right, hole later. But maybe um, I was thinking for the, just to start off, maybe you'd like to um, talk a little bit about the novel and maybe read a little for us. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, and also just want to thank, you know, Books and Books for having us. I wish I could be in South Florida right now. I'm wearing my brightest colored sweater uh, to sort of commemorate <laughs> that I wish I could be down there. And thanks, Paul, for joining. Um, Paul was my teacher at the Ira Writers Workshop in the beginning of 2018 when I was writing the novel. And it was very, very, I guess you could say gooey then. Um, and it was it was in a very rough shape. Um, but you know, the the book now, um, I'll give like a little synopsis and then just a quick reading. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the book examines a turbulent mentor mentee uh relationship between two academics at Oxford University, which sort of loosely parallels the Latin Greek myth of Apollo and Daphne. Um in which, in which, um, sorry, just a second, uh, the Latin Greek myth of Apollo and Daphne, you know, in which Daphne narrowly escapes the advances of the god Apollo, but only by being turned into a laurel tree. So in the book, we follow an ambitious young American scholar who's sabotaged by her mentor. And in the cat and mouse game that ensues, she finds herself doing whatever it takes to come out on top as she struggles um, to reclaim agency over her sort of personal, profess professional, and intellectual existence. Um, so that's kind of a long-winded way of saying the book is about love and revenge, about power and powerlessness, and ultimately about how far we'll go for the things that we desire. Um, so I'll just do a quick reading. Um, this is from, uh, it's one of the few like large flashbacks in the novel and uh, Tessa, the protagonist has just decided that she's going to skip her uh, boyfriend's father's funeral. Uh, her boyfriend's father has just passed uh, because she has to give a very, very extremely important presentation at a conference in Edinburgh. Um, she's in the car driving up to Edinburgh with her mentor, Chris, who she hasn't realized yet uh, is sort of romantically obsessed with her and has you know, a number of predatory instincts towards her. So I'll just begin. Edinburgh. In the months leading up to the conference, Tessa sometimes allowed herself to marvel at her change in circumstance from truck stop Waffle House to plenary session speaker in six short years. Chris drove them in his fiat, speeding the length of the Isle of England to compensate for the flights they'd missed, casting cigarette butts, 
into the annihilating rush of the open window. I, we already missed flights so I could be with Ben when Gabriel passed. Ben is Tessa's boyfriend. Tessa justified. This is not something I can afford to skip. He understands. I mean, I think he understands. Chris nodded and smoked. He listened with solemn intensity and gradually the conversation became more personal. Maybe she was nervous about the 322 person seating capacity. Maybe she needed weighty conversation to distract herself from the guilt that gnawed at her sleepless brain. Maybe she found in Chris an essential audience for the decision she had made. But in the journey, she felt herself hovering on the brink of what she did not know exactly. She knew only the trajectory of her life thus far and the imperative pers of persuading the car's inhabitants of that narrative. She told Chris about the first time she'd heard Ben play music, how the guitar ruffled the air and then his voice flooded the concert hall with a low vibrato, how she'd felt a chill along her arms and in her heart. The music moved her. Who was he and how had he happened like that? Because that was how it seemed to her that he had happened or that the music had happened in the same way her most sublime encounters with poetry felt like happenings, lodged in the time and space of her past as deeply and irrevocably as major life events, Apollo and Daphne, her high school graduation, those passages from Blake's Jerusalem, her father's funeral. Soon they were skirting Birmingham, then Manchester, and her thoughts began to spill out muddled but constant as she rolled new cigarettes for Chris, white cadaver-like tubes. The important thing was not Ben right now, but her relationship to these moments. She told him how she still possessed the yellowing notebook page on which she'd written her high school translation of those hundred lines beginning, Primus Amor Daphne Fovi. How that first encounter with Daphne and Apollo had struck her at her core, made a claim on her, raised her hairs on end and dragged her soul just for a moment out of her body. She talked to Chris about these things before, but always through a curtain of irony or self-effacement. As brittle trees on the median strip flitted by, she told Chris how she translated in Frondem Crines, in Ramos Brachia Crescent, as into foliage her hair, into branches her arms developed, and how, quote, develop at the time was still being bandied about as a sanitized descriptor for the mutation, mutations she and her classmates were undergoing. Her arms had still felt like ever lengthening noodles. There was apparently certain hair she was allowed to have and certain she was not. She was still growing used to her own, to her own odors. Her body had transformed, was transforming, and since it was her first trip through adolescence, she had no reason to think she wouldn't transform into another species next. The euphemisms of sex ed had formed a kind of rip current against the profanity that spelled from music, TV, the lips of her classmates. And she recalled noticing the last four letters of the Latin verb, even as she translated it to its most staid English equivalent, crescunt, develop. She recalled something rebellious and alluring about this observation, how language could be layered and insurgent. And maybe it was this that had caused the world to stop and be perfectly articulated in the text. It was January in Florida at the time. Her mother's row of Taiwan cherries was erupting into hot pink inflorescences. She had the house to herself, her sister at college, her father likely at the lab, her mother possibly also at clinic or on some errand, maybe shopping or getting a manicure with girlfriends, though perhaps Tessa was only associating the bursting flowers in the backyard with the angry fuchsia polish Cheryl sometimes liked to wear. In any case, Tessa was alone, she was sure, because she was laid out in the living room, neutral territory she wouldn't have basked in so freely with either parent around, for she preferred to assemble dictionaries and grammars on the floor when she translated, and so was sprawled out before the curtain windows, which admitted a view onto the backyard, short rolling lawn, angry fuchsia bloom, placid surface of the pond, creasing from time to time in the breeze. The soft pastel of the flowers, the ripple of light across the pond, her fingers digging into the braids of the woven carpet as if for a better grip, a so-called out of body experience. The Tessa considered the sensation more akin to merging than to leaving. In the same way a bird merges with the air when it first flies, or the way a narrow inlet joined the pond to St. John's River and then the sea, so that the pond might be almost might almost be said to constitute the same body of water as the ocean. The chills she'd felt rippling along her arms, the helium-like insurrection that announced you are encountering beauty, had something to do with empathy, she felt, 
the dissolution of the borders of oneself, the merging of her consciousness with the incomprehensibly vast reservoir of others. Yes, consciousness, that was the element, like water or air, that she dissolved into, not only Ovid's, but infinite throngs of others. Tessa had felt so transformed by this mystical experience that when Daphne suddenly sprouted roots and foliage, it had seemed logical. And that's when I knew I would not become a doctor, she told Chris. I had to read that last part because uh, it takes place in Florida. Um, but yeah, that's a reading. Thank you. That's great, man. Thank you. That, that, Thank it's, you. it's one of the things that I love about, about this book, and it, it reminds me of something Marilyn Robinson once used to say in class. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the best works of art embody their own meaning. And mm -hmm. one of the things that w once I noticed, the essential kind of rhythm or almost heartbeat that goes on back and forth between the corporeal, the corporeal, corporal and the spiritual, the, mm -hmm. the spiritual carnal, as she says someplace. And there's this pulse that goes back and forth and a kind of coextensivity and osmosis that she's always moving in and out of, which is just this very, very elegant, beautifully um, musical and poetic kind of um, uh, you know, deeper uh, narrative, but also characterological rhythm to her as a, as a character, which is really wonderful. Um, so, that, would you, so I'm curious, would you just talk about um, you know, the kernel, the germ, the inspiration, yeah. maybe how it elaborated itself. All yeah, that. yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I kind of started when I was in high school because I was a big Latin nerd and I would translate uh, blocks of Virgil's Aeneid into English and that was like my idea of fun. Uh, and so I think that even though I didn't become a classicist, there was an element of wish fulfillment there where I was getting to like live the life of being a classicist, uh, sneaking into that even though I, I wasn't a real classicist. Um, yeah, so I, that was always kind of in my DNA, but the actual story itself, you know, I was in my first year at, you know, the Iowa Writers Workshop, um, and I had, I was writing this, uh, novel or attempting to write this novel about three young adults, uh, based in New York City. And one of them was a, uh, classicist from Oxford and the other was a ballet dancer who only had one leg. And this was a project that was boring to everybody <laughs> in the class. And it was very, it was boring to me as well. And it wasn't going anywhere. And in my second year, uh, I was in Sam, uh, Sam Chang's uh, class, um, the director of the Iowa Writers Workshop. And uh, I kind of had my back against the wall. I had nothing to show to the other students in the class. And I went back and discovered these few paragraphs from the point of view of this classicist's Oxford dissertation advisor. And they were the only decent things that I'd written the entire year before. They had a lot of energy to them. And I very quickly wrote the first chapter kind of in an act of desperation, but it really struck a nerve with the class and everything just kind of you know erupted from there i wrote you know the first draft uh pretty quickly over the course of that year and you know that was the class that was right before your class at, at the workshop mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's funny that works i mean i've i've had the same i think a lot of writers have had that experience where you're writing what you know the novel is not and sometimes it's a problem. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is not going to be about a one-legged ballerina. This is not going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is right now because it's almost like you're. It's a you're making a casting or something or a mold. You know, right. you're making a mold, and then you know something's going to go in there, and then you start carving away or whatever the metaphor you th you know, and you find this, you find the you find Tessa, and you find her um, doing something that you love to do too. I mean, that one of the things I remember, um, I correctly or not was. Really, um, you know, when I was looking at that early draft, so just being very excited by it and really thinking it was one of those books where you got to go all in. You can't, yeah, you, you can't go half measure, like, you yeah. can't, because the people who are going to self select, like, ooh, it's sort of like, uh, you know, a, a, a um, ancient Roman Latin mystery that has to do with etymology and translation. And sort of like the people who want that don't want you to go in half measure. Yeah. There is like, a there was a funny mantra I remember from that class. I don't know if I have the wording exactly, but it was something like, 
you know, you might think that it's too weird, your project, but in fact, it might actually not be weird enough. And it was one of those things that kind of stuck with me. I mean, there's a whole sequence in the novel that is basically a full academic conference, like two full lectures from an academic conference. And as I was writing it, I was like, there's no way that this is going to be allowed to actually exist in the final in the final version of the novel. Like no one's going to want to read this. But I think that that class kind of enabled me to do some of the weirder things and like emboldened me to do them um, because we were this sort of little community where we were, you know, encouraging the like less commercial or weirder or more idiosyncratic instincts of the other writers in the class. Um, so yeah, I forget what the original time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, well, just, and how you, <laughs> that process of how you become, how you implicate yourself and you let the, you know, sort of the, the character or the subject draw you in. Um, Cause I, you know, I, that's a, I certainly, it's variations of that refrain, which is, you know, the problem here is that you actually haven't, fully given in to your deepest impulses. You're yeah. actually sort of right looking over and kind of being tentative as opposed to just go in, just go all yeah. in and write those lectures. You'll know quick quickly enough if they're no, if they're not interesting to people. Right. <laughs> I, but I do think that I mean what I what the, I love those lectures and one of the things that's that I think is you know one of the hallmarks of them is that you're clearly fascinated by them, right? Mm. So you know, you took the time to write good lectures, right? You know, and and, and so the, that comes across, you know, the, the page with, with the um, the reader. And I, I think that's the other thing is you love language. We're writers, you know, so you it's we spend our time working with words. And 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 here the idea of translation. So I mean, I spend a lot of time mucking around in the Bible, you know. So I'm always looking up Hebrew stuff. Yeah. Um, and and just and when you're talking about like love and revenge, that's all Shakespeare too. Who gets to call what what? Yeah, you know, and who has the power? And I mean, talk a little bit about that, maybe you know, this, some of that, that kind of dynamic that goes on between Tessa and Chris, and kind of the yeah institutional context they're embedded in, and all that. Yeah, stuff. I mean, there 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 are a lot of levels. I think at work, and you know, who gets to tell the story is one of the most important, um, most important things about this novel. And one of the things that it's grappling with the most, I mean, on the one hand, you have the Apollo and Daphne myth, which is very much about, um, you know, agency and very much about who has a voice and who doesn't. And in the novel, of course, you have this relationship between Tessa and Chris and one of the things that I came to realize in my research, uh, learning about academia and learning about these sort of mentor mentee relationships is how like heartbreakingly difficult it can be if there's not a good relationship with the mentor. Of course, there are many good relationships with mentors, many amazing relationships with mentors, but when they sour, and I think this is something that almost anyone can relate to in like any job with any boss, it can be very difficult to handle and it can be uh, very smothering. Um, and when I sort of noticed this parallel between the Apollo and Daphne myth, which was something that I grew up with and a very sort of common problem that people have um, with relationships with people who have power over them with asymmetric power dynamics and the way that those souring relationships can lead to paralysis, uh, which is so, so evoked by the image of Daphne being turned and turned into a world tree, yeah. um, the you know everything just started to resonate in a way that's very pleasurable for right. a writer, and you know that's kind of what led to just the novel like happening, um, mm -hmm. all of those resonances. Yeah, and then you know one of the things I really love about the about the book too is the way that it works with, um, you know, you, it's 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 never. There's no sleight of hand. It's never, um, it never invites the reader to say, you know, what does this really stand for? You know, spot mm -hmm. the Apollo and Daphne. It's it's right there. Mm -hmm. It's always right there for the reader, but also for the characters. You know, they are just explicitly working with these, and they're making parallels between themselves. And like, even what you were reading, you know, yes, yeah. constantly. 
um, using, you know, using the art to sort of, she's, she's making different narratives through the whole book. You know, yeah. You're reading the narrative and it's not like MC, mm -hmm. it's a duck, it's mm -hmm. a dog. But it's, it's we're, we're watching her construct a, a, a narrative or a series of narratives about these people and about the situations and about these Latin poets. Um, but she's also, <laughs> we're, all, we're watching her construct who is the narrative of herself and who she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was really important to me. I mean, in the later drafts of this novel, I became really interested in like the field of the reception of literature, which is like this whole subfield of classics. And it was important to me that Tessa be sort of, we, we, that we as the reader and even Tessa herself be able to sort of track her own personal change over the course of her life through her own ability or inability to read the Apollo and Daphne myth as beautiful. Uh, while we're also tracking, in, to some degree, you know, societies, the the actual reception of the Apollo and Daphne myth over the course of two thousand years, uh, with the you know Bernini statue, which is on the cover of the book, and which Tessa visits in Rome, um, to you know the present day, her actual uh, you know, to some degree, real life reliving of the myth, um, you know, that was really something that I became kind of obsessive over when I was doing the the later drafts of the novel and I thought it was like fruitful territory. Yeah, I mean it's, it's the, the and that I that the, I don't no spoiler alerts right. I don't I want to spoil but it's part you know part of the dramatic tension or the you know the what's the gripping about it is watching her really question you know what does it mean if on the one hand I look at this myth and it's been romanticized, or you know, the, the figurative yeah. version of it is is sort of endorses what Apollo is doing, um, and it, you know, but but I, I you know, what does it mean to what does it what does it mean about me if I think that that's beautiful in some way, even as I can, even as I grapple with thinking literally that's not what this not this myth is about. Yeah, know? yeah, um, and just the moving back and forth. I was thinking of the you were reading this, this, the, um, there's just a line that she talks about, um, uh, this, 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 it's taking it slightly out of context, but the, of a piece, the love she idealized by which the borders of one's person dissolved and integrated with some other essence. Yeah. You know, and so it's just, this all this idea of her sort of becoming coextensive with this poetry and these people, and then coming back, going back and forth between the real and the ideal. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because Tessa has a very strong desire to sort of live this life of the mind. And she's she has this desire, you know, for the best possible reasons. Like this is someone who has actually found her vocation in terms of what she is passionate about, what she's been passionate about, you know, at, since she was a teenager and what she's still passionate about right now. And um, <clears throat> the in spite of all this, you know, this person has gotten in her way and prevented her from sort of realizing, you know, her dream. And at the same time, the trappings of success that she's sort of after begin to become these sort of material trappings of success versus the idealistic trappings of success. You know, it becomes more about like a tenure track job than it becomes about the poets, the Latin poets themselves. And so that was something that was really, I thought, interesting to play around the ways in which someone's desire begins to take them into, you know, to begin to cause them to do things that they might not necessarily be proud of. Um, and that was actually something that we had sort of, you know, in that first class that I was in with Paul, it was something that we had begun to talk about as a possibility for Tessa. At, you know, what might she do that she might regret or what might she do that might compromise her values? And, you know, that leads to some of the things that end up, you know, happening in the book, those sort of, you know, discussions that we had uh, with an early draft of the novel. Yeah. And how you become obsessed with how you, how you become almost transfigured or metamorphosed into something you might not even recognize if yeah. the more idealistic version of you saw the more you know uh careeristic you know career or and and that's always that you know, it, you know for her trying to find the balance in you know you know such an elite institution such a storied institution 
such a relatively small and intense subculture within that institution because you know classics departments you know in places yeah. like harvard and oxford and Cambridge, those they they're they're like the most they're so rarefied you know it's yeah. just it's astonishing and usually there's about eight people so like, there's, yeah. there's not really, you know that so that that but that intensity of her 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 desire for that person and what's one of the things that's so appealing about her is that she's she's good at what she does mm. You yeah. know, sort of non non negotiable. You know, yeah. she's, she's she's going to do that. Yeah. Um. Um. So, well, I mean, I guess I'm interested. Well, one thing I could show is we talked about the early drafts. So I'll just show folks. For, is, is, so these are I used to when we do workshops, I would keep what I call my coloring books, and I would just do pages and pages and pages of just I just go through color coded. I can't even remember what the color codes are, but this is all about the first draft of. Mark the novel we're talking about. Amazing. You have I still um, have my class notes too, actually. <laughs> and it's almost a, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, it's all I realized our first workshop was almost exactly four years ago, which is just a funny thing that I a funny anniversary. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's I mean it's it is as it's a su subject and theme and dramatized in the book. Though it's interesting in the way that it comes out into the writer's life, which is, you know, we're a bunch of word nerds who sit around yeah. parsing each other's sentences and sort of saying, yeah, but if you did this and you did that, and that idea that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm also interested in maybe knowing a little bit more about then how the dr successive drafts came together and maybe what it was like working um, with your editor at Norton, maybe your agent or whatever. But because one of the things I love about this book is, kind of it's every once you start looking for it you see it everywhere but in this book i think it's really apt because of you know that sort of the proximities of the language and but um it feels like it's especially poignant reading this book feels like the the reading of, in the reading of the book your process for constructing it and and and, and discovering it for yourself is almost recapitulated it's almost preserved. It's almost like an archaeological kind of thing. Like, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, I could imagine the moment where he realized, she realizes, you mm. know, so, I, know, I talk a little bit about the. Yeah. It's, I mean, that, that's, that's interesting because there were a lot of, there were a lot of surprises for me in the course of writing the book. I had sort of an idea of where it was going to go. And a lot of that was from this, you know, argument about a footnote that begins the novel about whether Ovid is talking about love in the Apollo and Daphne sequence ironically or not. And Tessa and Chris are arguing about this footnote. It's holding up a paper of Tessa's. Um, I knew sort of the collision course that the two of them were on, but I had no clue how I was actually going to get to that collision. And uh, there were a lot of moments that surprised me it, I didn't really set out to write like a twisty book. I didn't think that I was going to do that, but it became a twisty book. And a lot of that was because I was twisting and turning and didn't know where I was going. Um, but twisting and turning, you know, in what became fruitful ways, but there were definitely moments in the course of writing it where I was stuck. And about halfway through the book, Tessa goes to Italy and she finds herself on this archaeological dig and she's investigating this obscure second century uh latin poet and i was stuck on that section for like nine months i mean i just kept writing it over again and trying again and like taking a step back and you know going running five miles and <laughs> like watching you know watching bad tv for three days because i needed to reset my mind i mean i was stuck for a really really long time on that section and it was when I um, had a call with another teacher of mine, Margot Livesey, who made this suggestion that actually ended up, you know, moving something which was previously at the beginning of the book to the end. And I won't say what it is because it's a pretty big spoiler, but it took the line of tension and just broadened it and just stretched it way out so that Italy could fit in that in that space. And then allowed the Italy section to become this sort of med long meditative section that was able to justify its existence in the novel. And, you know, then, you know, I was able to finish that and they come back to Oxford. And then, you know, the rest of that first draft was written very, very quickly, uh, you know, sitting at my window in, 
Iowa City on Brown Street and just having the time of my life <laughs> writing right. these, you know, crazy passages. But but yeah, I mean, there were definitely moments in there I had no idea were going to happen until they literally happened on the page. You know, it was a it was I was experiencing it at the same time that the reader will be experiencing it. And I think that, you know, I hope that that's what's going to be fun about reading, reading the book. Yeah, I mean, they say, I mean, that's the, you know, the, 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 the cliched version of it is, oh, you know, my re I didn't know what my characters were going to do. But there is that there's something deep about the, the, the essence of you know, I think of it as like quality control, which is like yeah. if, if I get to a moment, and I go, holy shit, you know, um, th then the writing is going to be more likely to preserve and, you know, recreate that moment of surprise or delight or revelation or whatever for the yeah. reader. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Margot Livesey is, you know, Noah. You know the way that she could take something and just say, "Well, what about this?" And she'll just yeah. like, "You get one degree," <laughs> and you scary. go, yeah. Whoa. "The whole thing is just like, you know, she's just absolutely brilliant, just brilliant." That, that's that's great. So then um, another thing now, because I'm you know nerding out because I love all this kind of stuff, but I love because um, I love it too, you know. So it's um, but the use in the in the book of uh, graphics and um, mm. figures and texts and kind of ephemera for lack of a better word but there's some visual stuff in the in the in the text Can you talk a little bit about yeah that's fun I actually haven't been asked that question yet and um, I'm trying to remember exactly like I was trying to figure out a way to make the Italy section richer mm -hmm. and I ultimately in the first draft there was no um, there was no Latin in it from the uh, fictional poet. I'm not going to give too much away here, but uh, there's a fictional poet who you know writes in Latin, and Tessa is on the verge of making a discovery about this ancient poet, and <clears throat> she's also in this you know liter or sort of academic one-upmanship um rivalry with her mentor chris so this is all the more tense and there's a, a a few pieces of uh stone let's say or marble that contain some poetry um in this necropolis that she finds herself in and it was really in the course of you know nerding out and writing this you know fake latin that i sort of it just sort of occurred to me how cool would it be if part of this discovery process occurred through the ac the actual like archaeological discovery of these pieces of stone and there was really no way to dramatize that for the reader without right. using some sort of graphic yeah. and so we you know i was literally just sitting there and Microsoft Word, I think, uh, you know, writing them out and drawing little boxes around them and drawing little scribblies. And it was amazing how realistic they looked uh, with five minutes of my pitiful graphic design. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was just like experimentation. And, you know, again, like everything, it took a number of different tries before we figured out how to sort of layer it into the story itself. But um, yeah, it was uh, it was just pure experimentation, really. Yeah, and again, I mean, just because I'm, I'm I happen to be I'm on this side, but you know that idea yeah. of you doing that, you doing that with your text is reproducing the action of the novel. Yeah, you know, like you're tessellating all these parts and going, "How? What if they go like this? What if they go like that? What if they go like that?" Um, I just think that's really cool. And I love it. It's like strata, different layers of, you know, I love mm -hmm. that. Like, I wish I could glue stuff in and put sparkles on it and put, a, you know, mm -hmm. some eaves in it or, you know, just to have it interacting, you know, in, in a way that's sort of four dimensional or something like that. I right. Think that's really, really cool. Um, yeah, that's one. So then we, 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 tell me a little bit, just describe a little bit what it was like to, um, um, you you there's some latin poetry in the book and yeah you wrote it yeah i mean i um i don't know if i would ever put myself in this situation again because it was it was just, it's just one of those things that you know it's hard to write latin poetry in particular because it has a metrical structure and i ended up finding 
this person on, you know, I used, I used Reddit, uh, the website, Reddit platform, Reddit for a lot of the research that I was doing. And I found these, you know, there are a number of people out there who actually compose Latin poetry still, but I found someone who was like, who was really good at it. And he was kind enough to sort of give me pointers. And then, you know, I spent like two or three weeks just composing this, you know, it's almost like creating a jigsaw puzzle, composing these Latin uh, verses. And, you know, once you had those, it could become almost like a prop in the, uh, in the, in the novel in the same way that you have a prop like in a play that can be used in different ways and played around with. And yeah, so it just felt like it was worth trying to get five or six lines of Latin poetry because then they could be played around with in you know interesting and intense ways. Yeah, I think I, I, this it's for me it's always just fun to do that. Try to write in some kind of radically different way than yeah. maybe the prevailing idiom or the more contemporary idioms of the characters. Um, and just again, like this, the, the, one of the ways this novel works so beautifully is just it's contrapuntal, you know, mm. and so it's just all this juxtaposition. And so it's kind of refractive or prismatic. Um, and so it's really cool to hear those voices. And they become, they become, uh, Tessa has an intimacy with them. Yeah. You know, the, you know the, to the extent that she values them, you know. They're valuable to her. She's valuable to us. So you know, we get to see this, this, yeah, this, uh, these other souls that she's kind of straining toward. Yeah, um, all the time and the you know the obscurity of the language and all that sort of stuff. It's really, really, really wonderful. Um, um, well, maybe maybe we should see if there's any any folks who have um, questions in the in the audience. Um, if people are interested in doing that, I mean, I I could. I've got plenty of other stuff I can ask you about, but just wondering if anybody, if we have any, if we have any questions. Is there a way to see? I'm not sure how to check the uh, chat. Yeah, I don't see. Um, when it, Oh, we, we, there's, one, there's a question from um, you all. Um, uh, hello, Mark and Paul. This is you all. Thank you um, both for such a delightful and edifying conversation. Um, uh, um, I have yet to receive my copy, Mark, and fully appreciate your novel. But hearing your reading and this exchange, I can't help but admire the dexterity and sensitivity with which you retold um, and perhaps transformed for our times that delectable yet predatory myth. The mm. formal challenge of working with myths is that the writer seldom escapes their power, but the Latinist the book does not seem to suffer that anxiety of influence. A laudable testament to your profound discernment and enviable narrative virtuosity. I suppose That's... my question, that, <laughs> that, that's gonna go you. on, <laughs> go on. That's, that's awesome, I, could, I hear, hear, I said that. I suppose my question, a veiled praise, really is this. How is the process of managing the competing stories, the myth and the novel, and negotiating the hazard of risking each collapsing into the other? Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really that's a really important question. I think that I I think that I definitely wanted to allow there to be a sort of valency between what we're reading as the A story of Tessa and Chris and how we're reading that, you know, overlapping or resonating or reflecting or refracting the Apollo and Daphne myth itself. I wanted there to be a little bit, I didn't want it to be like a direct recasting. And I think that the reader will sort of have fun thinking, oh, maybe, Chris, in, in what ways is Chris Daphne, or in what ways is Tessa Apollo, or you know, how do these roles shift over the course of the narrative? Um, what does it mean that this version gives voices to both characters? Um, you know, I wanted there to be space for the reader to sort of do work and to do work shifting between. Uh, the myth and the novel. And so I hope that that allows them not to collapse into each other, but to actually 
work with one another like in a productive fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, well, I, I agree with you all that you, you succeed in that because there's, you give space for the reader. It, it's, it never feels like it's sort of the, you uh, the, we probably talked about this in workshop too. Like, it's not one of those, like, you don't get the sense that it's the decoder ring kind of thing. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sequence that you'll see what you'll, you'll get to participate in what it's really about. Yeah. <laughs> Initiation. Yeah. Series. It's all right there. And the reader can, can, fool around with it and permutate it too. And like all shoulder to shoulder with Tessa and Chris, you know, to, uh, to an extent as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, please. No, are there more questions? I was just going to pontificate on something oh, else, but more. I really don't need to. <laughs> well, it's fun to pontificate. Um, uh, a uh, uh, question from Leslie. Love the book. Just finished it today. Can you talk a bit about the minor character Florence? Is uh, mm. she a more uncorrupted version of Tessa, a potential rival? Does she have a mythological counterpart? Mm. That's a great question. I love Florence is a really fun character. She's not on the page a tremendous amount, but she plays a role. She's a translator. Uh, she is sort of the resident translator for the Marius poems into English. And she appeared in the book initially just as Tessa's uh, conversation partner in the opening scene uh, where Tessa's teaching a class and a cigarette butt falls out of the sky and it turns out to be her mentor Chris's cigarette butt. And it's sort of you know, sets off some of the action of the novel. And Florence was a student, but I found that I needed a way for the reader and even myself as an English speaker and not a, a native Latin speaker <laughs> reader, I needed a way for us in English to be able to interact with the Latin poetry in a, you know, playful or uh, pleasant or enjoyable, entertaining manner. And so Florence became this translator and I thought it would be really fun to have a student who could translate these poems in a way into an English version that would be almost like catchy or fun, even though, and, and would somehow imitate the rhythms, which is the rhythm, which is so important for the Latin poetry itself. And so Florence became this uh, vehicle to do that. But in so doing, she also becomes this character all on her own and someone who has a uh, passion or vocation that sort of mirrors Tessa's, although Florence's is more clearly towards translation and writing poetry maybe, whereas Tessa's is more towards you know academic philology and research. So I don't know if she's a rival so much for Tessa, but she's certainly a mirror of a previous self for Tessa. And, you know, Tessa is oftentimes encountering her, the child version of her own self. Um, you know, there are some moments in Italy where she encounters this sort of lost version of herself. And Florence is in many ways representative of that as well. Um, and maybe the relationship between Tessa and Florence is representative of a mentor-mentee relationship that's you know, a positive one, as opposed to the one with Tessa and Chris. Um, so yeah, that's Florence was a really fun character to have in, and and you know, I and I I would love to have more of her. I would have loved to have had more of her. That's great. Yeah, I think she's a great character too. Right? Um, let's see. Um, did, 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 uh, Cynthia says, "I look forward to reading the book." Uh, I was a Latin nerd also who went into art history. How early did your writing ability present, present, and when did you switch from Latin to literature? That's funny. I, my, I wouldn't say that my writing ability ever presented. I, I would say, you know, I was um, the 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 ratio between my natural ability for writing fiction and uh, you know where I've been able to get to is probably more extreme, I think, than any published writers. I mean, I was really, really bad. I could write essays about uh, novels and about poetry. Um, I felt comfortable writing in an expository manner, but I was 
really not comfortable writing in a dramatic manner. And so it was a process beginning in you know, my senior year of college, actually, and, and the year after of, you know, it was it was tough and and uh, not good for the ego, but a lot of sort of writing in the mornings before work and struggling to figure out how to you know express myself in a dramatic manner as opposed to an expository manner. Um, you know, it, it was after doing that for maybe three or four years that I began to see uh, progress. Um, yeah, but it, it took a, it took a while. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's always humbling. It's a fine line between humbling and humiliating. <laughs> and <often> right. <laughs> A lot of time the wrong oh, side. Both. Oh, yeah. but there is a real, there is a real technical, you know, to writing narrative prose. Narrative yeah. is the whole. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, we may be advanced writers and advanced human beings, but writing narrative is a whole thing. You know, um, that's that takes a while to, to take forever. If you um, yeah. let's see, uh, Emma asks, can you describe a bit what it felt like to write across gender specifically? Um, you have very compelling sections, both inside the mind of Tessa, but all those also describing the way she moves through space and time as a woman in academia. Mm, thank you for that question. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't something that came, uh, you know, at it wasn't uh, first attempt uh, that it came it came over many attempts, and you know I remember my classmates saying for example that they were you know there was something there there was something not quite right but i didn't know exactly what was not quite right and i remember just for example my classmates saying that tessa i was writing all these tense confrontation scenes with her and chris and they were saying it didn't seem like she was that scared or intimidated you know in these very tense you know physical scenes between the two of them and i realized that <clears throat> You know, I'm personally taller than Chris, and I realized that I hadn't really left my own body when I was writing those scenes. And when I made this change where I just imagined myself looking up slightly at Chris as opposed to, you know, looking slightly down at him, it enabled me to begin to inhabit the space that Tessa would inhabit. And then, you know, other things like I mentioned going on Reddit every day after I finished uh, writing, I would go on re the subreddit Ask Women and subreddit Female Fashion Advice. And I would learn about, you know, all of these things that would be part of Tessa's world, but were not a part of my world. So in the last few sections, for example, she's wearing uh, a shell top when she presents at conferences and she's wearing slingback shoes, uh, which end up playing, you know, a big role in the novel and those were elements of Tessa's material reality that are not part of my own that you know became like again like props in the uh novel and enabled me to like become incrementally close incrementally closer to inhabiting her physical reality and you know there are lots of other things that enabled me to begin to close that gap uh, in running across gender but you know those were just just a few of the ones at the beginning. Yeah, there's that process of layering. You just keep finding you know, yeah. just a bit more about the character, a bit more about the character. Um, I mean, yeah, I always think of it as, you know, you, you know, the the ideal is that you're you're writing about Tessa, who is a woman, as opposed to writing like I'm writing about a woman first, and then I'm trying to exactly, get to yeah, because they just end up, in, you know, yeah, your and graphic nonsense. Yeah, there was, and I remember there being a quote from your class to that effect that I had written down and underlined, like, um, you know, I'm not writing about a, you're not writing about a character that is a woman, you're writing about Tessa, who is a woman. It yeah. came down to the last part of that was discovering what the things are that she's passionate about and what her desires are that form sort of the core of her character. And that was you know, the last part of just discovering who she was and being able to make her, you know, exist as an individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think maybe um, Carolina, maybe we, 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 this is sort of addressing the next question, which is what, what's the most difficult thing about writing um, K 
characters from the opposite sex, you know? And then, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think it just comes back to, you know, and I made this mistake at the beginning trying to think, you know, what would a female character do in this scenario? And it was like this knee jerk um, reaction. And it's never the right question to ask, you know, it's right. always, you know, what, what would Tessa do in this scenario? Yeah. And you, you know, eventually you find that. And then all the other things are just, as you said, layering, like, you know, the elements of her material reality and ways in which, you know, she was, she would have been socialized differently than the way that I was socialized as a boy or a man growing up. There are ways in which those things are different. And those were things that I, you know, slowly discovered as well, but it all comes down, it all comes back to figuring out what, what Tessa would do in this situation versus any other person who exists or character who exists. Yeah. And I think that goes back to that kind of the, you know, that gesture, it's aesthetic. It's a, it, you do this in the aesthetic realm, but it's, it's, um, it's rather you're trying to write from the inside of this human person outward rather than outward, in, you know, trying to actually preempt anybody being brought up short and saying, wait, no 14 year old right. girl this did, 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 would ever do that. Cause what you want to get them to believe in the character is that, you know, character X is not a 14 year old girl from blah, 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 in 1950. She's herself. Yeah. And yeah, I believe yeah. that she would do it because I believe in her. You know, so yeah, I think that's yeah. You know, um, let me see. There's another question here. Um, sorry. Uh, one uh, Mari says, "Wonderful novel. The story has a real cinematic quality to it. Um, has there any? Uh, has there been any interest yet in optioning it?" Hmm. Uh, there's been. I've. There have been. There's been some talk about it, but it is not yet optioned. And. I think that, I mean, my personal opinion about books into movies, the movies that I love that were books are always better than the book itself. And it's rare, but it sometimes happens. And usually that occurs when a director or writer, whoever, um, you know, is in charge of that sort of makes it their own thing. And I would hope if it gets made into a movie that the movie is going to be even better than the book. I would pray. Um, because uh, you know that would just be that would just make me so happy. That would make me so happy to see a version of it in film, and I love film. Um, that's good, and it's and that's exciting, and that's itself like a, a work of art. Yeah, that's what I, the people I know who have had um, you know their books turned into films. Mm -hmm. They are, are often the kind of common theme through their through their you know, when they give advice, I don't have to worry about that with my book, but you know, but the, um, <laughs> yeah, they just you say, what, someday. <laughs> what you just hope for is that yeah. they make a good movie. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to make the Latinist. You made the Latinist. Right. It would be a movie that was, an, it's another work of art inspired by or influenced by your work of art. Yeah. You know? So again, yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really cool. There's something very yeah. sad. About that. And and when I was a kid, I would I would be incensed by like the movie version of Narnia or something, or that didn't follow the book to the T, or like the first Lord of the Rings that didn't have Shelob, but Shelob was in the book. And now I'm just so I'm I'm so on the other side of that spectrum, where like you can do whatever you want with it, just make it be good. Like please make make it be good. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I won't go to talk about Lord of the Rings because we was that's it, but, but <laughs> Lord of the Rings, you know, in the 70s, and I was like 10, and I never thought about it since. And then when I saw that first movie, I was like, this is the best movie that anybody's ever made, you know, because it just like totally that was my experience, yeah, brought me back to when I was like 10 and just flipping out about it. You know, yeah, the story, it was just like, wow, he got it. Like, there's that he got yeah. something, he did his thing with it, but he just got that the whole atmosphere and the essence and the texture and everything, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I the, the, so we've we've answered all questions, it's solved all mm. mysteries. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> is there anything, anything else that you that you would, would like people to know about the book or? Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm just looking at my notes here. I mean, I think that uh, I think that you know I was just thinking about little things from our from our class, and there was something that you used to talk about with you know 
going through the Oxford English Dictionary and finding words from the Anglo-Saxon that really embodied their me their meaning. And I realized that I had sort of taken that to heart with this book, even though it's about a Latinist. And I created this whole list of good non-Latinate words. It's this giant document that I have on my computer because I kept finding myself trying to come back to those words that really embody their own meaning. And it became like, it really helped me in the course of finding the voice and the prose and the rhythm of the novel, which is, you know, so much about the materiality of language. And it was just this curious paradox that I noticed in the course of writing the book. I don't really know what to make of it, but it came out of that, you know, initial class. And it was something that I thought was fun and, and worth mentioning. That's what I, all those, I have, just these big decks of index cards. Yeah. Just have those words, heal. But and what's interesting is they're all literally, they have literal meanings, but a lot of them are, um, they have to do with uh, naming land or earth, you know, geological things, but also human body parts. So you have a knee of rock or an mm. elbow of something or a heel of stone or that sort of thing. Same thing that you, you know, that idea of going from the ideal to the real and back, that kind of commerce between. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Substantial and the kind of like objective. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. That's, that's, it's nice to know. You know I still do that. I now, I, you know, I have two co two full copies of the Oxford English Dictionary, one for upstairs and one for downstairs. <laughs> you won't worry about that. Well, that, that's, I mean, I, I think that's maybe, you know, as we're sort of wrapping up, you know, I think that's one of the things that's, that's, that, that is, you know, the book fully gives itself over to its joy. To, to, to its enjoyment of and joy in language and meaning and how it moves and how it breathes and it's a kind of music and you know how it goes through a person's heart and a person's soul and just and mm. and um because you couldn't fake that you couldn't just assign mm. that to the character yeah. you, you know um and i think that's partly what, what you know and they are you know it's a it's a construction made out of words and so the the, the care and the attentiveness to the language um, is is um, you know, that in itself signals to the reader that it's valuable to the character to you, and so it's yeah worth that kind yeah. of yeah yeah thanks for articulating that <laughs> it's better than I could articulate it <laughs> I can't remember what I just said no, no but <laughs> you, you know it just it it gives it a kind of resonance a kind of yeah you know, and that kind of musicality to it so that's just that's just wonderful um, well I think. Perhaps we're at the at the end of our hours, and I think you, especially, and the audience have, and me to some extent, acquitted ourselves quite well for a Tuesday evening, cold Tuesday evening. We do have one more question. Oh, so great! To okay. To that first. Um, Gary asks: uh, the book is very erudite in theme, plot, and writing. Um, does this play well in the larger market? <laughs> question. Here. That's an interesting question. I guess we're kind of, it's like a, a laboratory test right now to see, you know, how the larger market responds to it. And, you know, I think it's been going relatively well so far. And, you know, there is like a sort of thriller aspect to the book too, which, you know, it's almost like for some people, I think wrapping the erudition in bacon and feeding it to them something sweet or savory around it. Um, but I also just love thrillers um in addition to loving more of the sort of highbrow stuff or the plotless cerebral you know language driven um prose and literature so um i think that the i think that i think that giving uh readers the benefit of the doubt is always the right thing to do and I think that, you know, people will respond to this and people will respond to sort of the love that goes into it from the author and, and the love that goes into the erudition from the characters. Yeah, I think that's well, that's, that's, that's perfectly put. I think that there's, you know, um, that if we talk about, the, you know, if, if it's a book you, as the author, if it's a book that you feel like you'd like to read, that's yeah. a pretty good indication that there are people out there who would like to read it as well, you know? Yeah. And yeah. if we had a second hour, we could go into the fact that, you know, these different genres that you're working with, they're not exclusive of one another. Yeah. Air yeah. like a good rousing plot 
and te- you know the thriller and the, you know the mystery solving and all that sort of stuff. Those things that they are often artificially put at odds. Yeah, I agree. You know, they're presented yeah. or talked yeah. about in these cartoon versions um, to just create false dilemmas over which people can get bylines or something. I, yeah. And that's what's fun to collapse. Like those are the most fun things for me to collapse. And it's collapsing reader expectations and it's collapsing, you know, yeah, these artificial boundaries between different types of writing. Um, And it's really fun, in my opinion, to play around with that. Yeah. 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 The more genres, the better. Absolutely. Yeah. This one's in spades. It's great. It's great. Um, I think that's, I think that's all the questions. Um, Should we? Should we wrap it up? Let's maybe we should wrap it up. Okay. Well, I, I want to say again, thank you, Paul, for being here. And thank you, Books and Books, for hosting. I'm really grateful. Thank you both pleasure. so much for this conversation. And thank you to everyone who joined tonight. And please don't forget to buy the book from um, your local indie bookstore. Or if you're in Miami, Books and Books, and come into store because we are open. And I hope everyone has a great night tonight. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Bye. Y'all.